Okay, so um, let's begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Millie's Guide to Medical Careers UK versus US. So whether you're watching live or watching the recording on YouTube, thank you so much for taking some time out of uh, your day to watch what I know will be a very insightful and interesting panel. Uh, my name is Hiba and I'll be your moderator for today. So for those of you joining a Millie panel for the first time, Millie is a company dedicated to building a community for international school students globally. As an international student myself, I know that sometimes you may struggle to get the help you want when it comes to career guidance, major selections, and university choices. So Millie is here to help you figure all of that out. For this reason, Millie hosts webinars and panels such as this one on a weekly basis. You can learn all about our past and future events on our website, www.milliegroup.com. And for more information on our events at Millie, check out our Instagram at Millie underscore group. Last but not least, I have some very important and exciting news, which is that Millie's Global Spring Internship Program for 2020 2022 is now open for applications. So if you're looking for a very meaningful, remote, 100% virtual internship with a genuinely amazing company, I highly encourage you all to apply. You can find out more info on how to apply on our website and socials. So without any further ado, let's get started with Millie's Guide to Medical Careers UK versus US. So how this is going to work is I'm going to first ask the panelists some pre-prepared questions, but for all the audience members out there, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A chat at any time throughout the panel, and I'll make sure to bring them up for the panelists in the last 10 to 15 minutes. So I encourage you all to ask questions, and whether they're for a specific panelist or for everyone in general, I'm sure they'll all be very willing to answer your questions. So today we have four amazing panelists who are all studying medicine in either the UK or the US and we're going to hear from them and about their experience and their insights. So firstly, I'd love if you could all introduce yourselves. So can you please tell us your name, the city that you are in and the city that you're from and one fun fact about yourself. Nicole, um, we can start with you. Alrighty, hi everyone. My name is Nicole, a third year medical student at uh, VCU. Um, so I'm currently in Richmond, Virginia. Um, it's about like two hours away from DC. Um, I am from a lot of different places, but I'm Canadian. I, I have ties to like Beijing and Hong Kong and LA. Um, and fun fact would be, I guess my favorite ice cream is, you know, um, either sesame ice cream or um, this like salted caramel from Salt and Straw, if anybody knows what that is. Hi everyone, my name is Chloe. I'm a final year medical student at King's College in London. Um, I'm originally from uh, Essex, which is in the east of England. Um, and a fun fact about me, I spent 10 years abroad growing up in Hiroshima and Shanghai. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Willis. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong. I'm currently at uh, Duke University in North Carolina. I'm a third year also. Uh, fun fact about me, I used to, I trained sea lions for a summer during college. Um, and I, that was uh, something I wanted to do before I wanted to go into medicine. Hi, uh, I'm Alap and I'm studying at the University of Dundee, which is a B town up in Scotland. Um, I'm a fifth year. And a fun fact is I actually did med school in Australia for three months and then I kind of transferred to the UK. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, great. That's very interesting fun facts. So we'll start with some pre-university questions. So I want to ask everyone if you always want to go into medicine. So why or why not? For me, um, medicine wasn't really like in my mind until college. Um, I went to UCLA, um, but growing up, I always wanted to do something with science. And I actually went into college thinking I would do research. Um, but then through like extracurriculars, um, I just felt like I really enjoyed kind of the like patient interaction, kind of like the more conversation, getting to know people's side um, and being able to do something um, more direct and uh, like with research, I feel like you have to go through a lot in order to impact people. But um, with medicine, you can like do it then and there. Um, so that was kind of what uh, drew me to medicine. Um, so I kind of always knew that I wanted to do medicine from about the age of 13, 14. Um, and then I applied to it and was unsuccessful, but I'll touch on that a bit later. So I came into medicine a slightly different route. Um, but uh, and echoing what Nicole said, I find the patient interaction and just 
the sort of impact you can have as a healthcare professional quite profound in and it doesn't negate the kind of importance of research but I didn't nicely see myself being a part of the research that a lot of the biomedical scientists and other people um, do today so pretty similar to Nicole always had a keen interest but I'm also a people person so I like that patient interaction. Yeah, I had a pretty similar journey to Nicole. I uh, also came into university. I went to Santa Barbara in California, so still throw away from Nicole, actually. Um, I didn't really want to do medicine at the time. I wanted to do marine biology, took a bit of a circuitous route into research, but then I really missed uh, the human component to all of that. Um, I, I, I remember reading a book called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You, and it kind of talked about finding passion and what it meant to be uh, passion about what you do and it, the argument in the book was you have to build it yourself and I looked at what I wanted, what I loved during the time which was um, teaching people things I loved to teach I loved um, to help people and I loved science and I thought the sort of the clear precipice between the three was was my medicine so that's why I chose that after college Yeah, I think it was quite similar to the panelists as well. Um, and I think that's something that's quite common in a lot of medical students is the human aspect and kind of enjoying the social interaction. Um, I also really enjoy kind of being a detective because I think a doctor is essentially a detective and kind of just figuring out what's going on and kind of putting the pieces together and coming up with a solution. So I think that's kind of what drew me to medicine as well. Amazing. It's I think it's interesting that all of you had like different characteristics that you kind of combined like a puzzle to land on medicine. That's really um, interesting to hear. So I want to ask a bit about the prep to get into medicine, because as some of you are in the UK and some of you are in the US. So what was the prep like to get into your degree? And are there any useful sources or anything you did specifically that helped you get into medical school? I feel like for the US, um, well, obviously you need your bachelor's degree first. And, so, and then also with that, you need um, like a lot of extracurriculars, a lot of clinical experience in terms of like shadowing or like, um, you know, being in the clinical environment. And then on top of that, you have to have like research and then, um, you know, like community activities. So being able to like balance all of that during college, um, I think is pretty important. Um, and then also like the MCAT um, and then also just like honing in on like interviews and your application. Um, but I think the biggest resource I had was all the mentors that I've had, like by far better than any like single resource that I've had is just um, having a group of friends or a network to um, help you, you know, answer any questions and like not everybody's in like the same shoes. So like being able to um, hear from different people's perspectives and their input was was extremely helpful for me. So um, preparation to come to school, uh, medical school in the UK um, kind of varies. So you can go into it at 18 um, and straight out of school. Um, I was unsuccessful in that, so I had applied and I hadn't done very well on the entrance exam, the UCAT, the, U, um, the United Kingdom Clinical Amplitude Test. So I actually went into it and applied in my final year of my bachelor's degree, my undergrad, and then entered it in my uh, the year after that. Um, and I entered a four year program instead of the five year program because of uh, as I'm a graduate, it was more competitive, but it kind of almost matched the US style of doing an undergrad plus this graduate degree um uh, again i think what nicole said having mentors and having a network is so important you can do all the revision you want and all the prep and that's incredibly important but you need to have a realistic expectation of um what medicine entails um and mentors really help secure that and help you think through that um so my kind of plan to medical school was a bit different but you can do it both ways you can do a bachelor's and then do go into it as a graduate or you can um, go straight in from when you graduate sixth form in the uk Yeah, wow. Just lo would love to echo what both Nicole and Chloe had said about mentors. I think that's definitely, honestly, the biggest resource I, I had during in my medical school journey was like having people who've gone through this before and to bounce ideas off of. You know, I had a couple of um, friends who were a couple of years older than I was when I graduated uh, who've been through the medical school process and they were in medical school themselves. So having them to like talk about, you know, what my application is going to be like, um, how do I study for the MCAT. Um, 
uh, that was big, a huge. Uh, another one I would love to plug is Khan Academy. Um, so in the U.S., MCAT is hugely important. I'm sure the UCAT in the U.K. is also quite uh, important in getting to medical school, uh, as Chloe mentioned. Um, but Khan Academy is there to teach you almost everything you need to know. Uh, it's it's a free resource for everybody. Uh, I honestly I love uh, what Saul Khan and and their team have done. So um, big plug for them. Yeah, I think Chloe explained um, what you kind of need for UK applications really well. Um, and I kind of tried to get some sort of work experience before uni, um, just to kind of know this is what I want to do. And I think it's, it'll be good if you can uh, get that for yourself. Um, also, I think taking any opportunities at school to kind of take part in leadership or sports or some sort of arts, that really helps the application. Um, so for UK, uh, like Chloe said, you need UCAT, and I use a lot of books. Um, and there's also online kind of tests and online things um, that you can find on Google. Um, and some of them are paid, some of them are free. Um, and just one last tip, and something that I did was kind of when you write your personal statement, just get someone to go over it. Or if you can, if you know someone in med school, get a senior to go over it, because um, they'll kind of know what the university is looking for. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I did. Okay, that's great. Um, so in terms of the actual academics of your course, since you're in different degrees, like the, the ones studying the UK are doing an MBBS and then the, uh, the US is like an MD. So how competitive is your course? And do you have any advice on how to do well in your degree? Sorry, just to clarify course as in like our current um, like MD. Yes, okay. you're, you're okay. like your specific medical degree. Um, I would say it's competitive to get in. Um, like it's competitive for like Americans to get in in the US in general. And then on top of that, you have like being international. Um, and then the fact that not every single school accepts international students. Um, but I would, I would say it's competitive. And um, in terms of like the environment, I think once you get in, people are much more like willing to help and like study groups and um, things like that. Um, but in terms of like doing well, I think really trying to figure out your learning style because you're learning like, you're not learning things like you did in undergrad. Um, it's, it's like a completely new kind of way of thinking and way of memorizing and so, I guess my advice would be like to figure out, use the first couple, like, I guess we don't have that much time, but like first couple of blocks um, to uh, figure out your learning style and like what works and what doesn't work. And then um, question banks are always, always very, very helpful. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, figuring out kind of like uh, always getting feedback and then also figuring out like what you need to work on and targeting that. So um, the course at King's College London is actually quite a big university for medicine. So a regular undergraduate course, which is five years, um, it has over 3,500, 4,000 4, applicants, and there's about uh, 350, 400 spaces. And then for the course that I was doing, which is the four year course where I essentially skipped the first year, um, there's 3,000 odd applicants of 30 places. So the, my one was particularly more intense because of um, the lack of the first year so I joined them in their second year of medical school. Um, in terms of uh, competitiveness and then the nature of medical school once the course starts, it's very much, and I don't know if this is just the environment in London, but it's a very much, you can be supported, but there are some individuals who remain competitive for life, which is fair, um, and that's completely up to them, but I've managed to find a nice group in medical schools where we support each other, we try and work together, because at the end of the day, you don't work alone as a doctor, you work as part of a team. So I think um, that's really important to bear in mind and something that I think you should always try to explore when you get into medical school or into your undergraduate bachelor's before entering medical school is find your tribe because once you find them, it's hell of a lot easier to get through medical school because it's a hard one. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, echoing what Chloe and Nicole had said, finding your people is really important. I think, um, as Nicole said, getting into medical school is probably the most competitive piece, piece of the process. Um, once you're in, people here are really nice. I mean, at Duke at least, I, I feel like it's um, maybe, maybe it's a little specialty dependent. You know, if you really want to go into a very competitive um, specialty like plastics or orthopedic surgery, 
um, then maybe there's a bit of more of a competitive environment just because of the way that the U.S. works is a very limited number of residency slots for those um, specialists. Um, but if you know, it, it, it really, I think because everyone's in such a very unique journey in medicine, it's hard to become to be compare or be competitive because everyone's doing something very different or everyone wants to go into a different route. So I, I found that medical school uh, after you get in has been very, very wonderful, very supportive. Um, people are, like, like Nicole said, very willing to help um, study groups um, and people really looking out for each other. So just wanted to dispel that a little bit. Yeah, I think um, med, med school in general is quite competitive because if you look at the entry requirements, everyone's almost got an A from school. So when you get into med school, everyone's kind of already into studying and trying to be the best. So it does get quite competitive at times. But I think, um, like the other panelists have said, you find the right group of friends and you form study groups, you can uh, meet up regularly to stay on top of things. It gets a lot easier. Um, with med school, there's also lots of assignments and submissions. Um, while on top of keeping you go make sure your practical skills are still well um, and also study for exams at the same time so it is a lot to do but if you kind of manage your time well i think it'll it'll be okay um and yeah i think a lot of the i think there's different groups some really want to do well some kind of want to pass and just become doctors i know in the uk um you're great you get ranked to the deciles based on your scores and then that's how you get a job at least as a junior doctor. So if you kind of want to get into London for your job, that's a lot more competitive than somewhere like Scotland or Wales. Okay, perfect. I think that's like, you all have given like really good advice that can be applied across a range of uh, careers, actually, not just medical school, but it's really uh, informative. So I want to ask like, what is your favorite part? What is the favorite part of your degree and what is your least favorite? I feel like my favorite part is um, actually, uh, so I don't know how like programs in the UK work, but for a lot of US medical schools, it's like two years or one and a half years of like uh, classroom staff. And then you get like two more years of um, like clinical rotations. I feel like that is honestly the best part, like being able to work with patients, like kind of going back to like why we all went into medicine. Um, like, I think that has definitely been the highlight and being able to like you know, use some of the things that you've learned the past couple of years. And like, you know, when doctors like talk about things, you're like, oh, I know that. Or like when they like are um, like when they agree with your plan, like I think I think that is the best part. Um, and so it makes you feel like you're, you know, kind of almost a doctor. Um, but I think the worst part would probably be kind of the um, just like the long hours and then having to come home and study and like also deal with life and like um, the fact that everyone else is also going through that and it's kind of like harder to like reach out and to hang out. Um, I just think that it's, it's a little like isolating sometimes, um, but sometimes it's fine. So. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, in the UK, at least at King's. So, um, in second year, we got two days a week of placement from the offsets. So we had lectures and then we had one day in general practice as a family physician and then another one in the hospital. So we had that from the offset and then that increased to three days in my second year, third year. And then for the last two years, you're completely on placement and everything's remote, like remote learning and lectures. So my favourite bit is for sure being on placement, being in the hospital, being in the GP, seeing patients, meeting them, clerking them, you know, taking their history. Why have they come in? if they're in A&E or why did they present to the clinic for X, Y, or Z? That's by far my favorite because you learn while you do it. As much as lectures could be interesting, some of them can be really dry, if I'm honest, like really dull. So I'd rather much be, um, rather be at hospital learning about something while I'm there treating that patient. So I'd say that's my favorite bit. I would say my least favorite bit, to be honest, is the studying and not because I don't like what I'm doing. It's just the sheer volume of what you need to learn and to the certain level you do to pass your exams, not just pass them, but to do well. Um, I find that the hardest. So I don't mind studying, it's good, but balance it on top of having a life and then making sure you've done your washing, your cleaning, your whatever, whatever other chores you have in the day. And then sometimes you're like, I actually want some fresh air and some exercise. I would say that's the difficulty is it, it's not just studying cramming for exams, it's little and often studying for years and years and years. Um, 
and I think that's the probably the worst bit and not like it's my least favorite but it's the, probably the yeah so my favorite part at least favorite it's I, I kind of like explain this answer by explaining my program a little bit so Duke is a little bit unique in that we do a weird third year program where we basically shove the first two years of didactics that as Nicole had mentioned into one year and then we have a third year off essentially to do whatever interesting thing you want to do most people do research uh, some people do dual, dual, dual degrees um, so I think my I'll, I'll start with the answer the least favorite part my least favorite part was trying to get through two years of medical didactics into one in one year uh, this sort of ties in some advice and like make sure you understand what program you're going to um, they're very different in the US so make sure if you need two years to do didactics versus the one year versus the 1.5 there's a lot of different programs and how they're structured so make sure you look into that before you apply uh, I think doing that in one really took a big toll on like everyone's mental health and my classmates and it, it was uh, as Chloe mentioned trying to balance your life uh, during that first year when you're trying to learn everything very difficult but to caveat that also is that the, my favorite part was getting to clinic early so it's um, so the benefit of that was that in second year we got to go start working in the hospital immediately so we get three years of clinical um, and as Nicole and Chloe had already alluded to, like being there by the bedside with the patient, um, you know, trying to apply the things you finally learned, it, that is, there's no better feeling, right? Like that's because that's what you're there for. That's what you've trained, what you've wanted to train for. So that, that, that's definitely my favorite part. Um, so in Dundee, we kind of have a similar program, so it's a five-year program, um, and you do kind of theory for three years but you're still seeing patients from first year so I kind of started to speak to patients in my first week which was really fun um and I think like the other panelists the best part was kind of speaking to patients and just seeing the gratification when you can uh, do something simple like take blots and then as a medical student you've actually got the time to sit down and speak to them and a lot of patients are quite lonely and all they need is a chat and just the thankfulness in their face once you speak to them for 10 minutes just makes your day. Um, I think the worst part is, like Nicole said, it's kind of balancing everything out um, because you're kind of constantly on board or you studying and then you kind of have to socialize, make friends and you kind of have to fit in sleep somewhere as well. So that's probably the worst part. Okay, that's great. So I want to ask something about if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your high school self um, in order to prepare better or something you wish you would have known uh, before applying to or coming to medical school? Um, I guess one thing I wanted, I would want myself to know earlier is to keep a log or track of some of the highlights or experiences that I've had that made me feel like, oh, like this is what I want to do. Um, I feel like that would have been very helpful, not only for like writing my personal statement, but also for me to kind of like realize like these are the things that matter to me and that'll kind of like keep me going, even though, you know, we talked about how hard it is, but like um, it'll it'll just help me keep me going um, and figuring out like what's important to me. Um, that's one thing. And then number two, not so much medicine related, but I wish I had developed um, like kind of more hobbies and other things to do just to like balance out my life a little bit. I think I was able to do that in college, but I would have wanted to do that earlier on. Um, my major bit of advice really that I would wish I told young Chloe when she was six, 16, 17 applying to medical school is it's not the be all, all end all if you don't get accepted. Um, and as much as it could be very disheartening, because there's a there's a there's quite a high rate of you not getting like a successful interview, successful application, and getting into med medical school. Some people reapply it again and again, year after year. There's alternate routes going into it, so you could reapply the next year, or you could do a, a bachelor's degree and then apply for a graduate course. And I know it's more competitive, but it would actually allow you to understand if medicine is actually what you want to do. It was what I wanted to do after three years of biomedical science. I was like, mm, lab work, not for me. No, thank you. So I wanted to apply to medical school, whereas some people, some of the my other colleagues in my year, they're not going to go into medicine after they graduate because they don't want to do it because they went in at 18. They had no idea what they wanted to do with their lives. They thought, I like science. I like this and went in and now they don't want to be doctors. 
So as much as it's really hard at 17 to take that rejection, it might actually be uh, like a blessing in disguise. Um, don't let that dishearten you and don't not apply again. But just think about alternate routes um, if things don't work out, because there are a lot of things that could be out of your control. Um, but yeah, that would be my main bit of advice. Yeah, if I could go back and talk to myself, younger me, I would say I think the biggest thing for me was I treated life like a checklist when it comes to medical school very much so. Like, you know, in the U.S. is like a... Uh, you go online and you'll find like, oh, here are the things you must have to go into medical school. Like you have to have volunteer experience, you have to have research, you have to have this GPA. Um, and you know, some of that is very true, but I think what I've learned in medical school is that, uh, you know, people fall in love with the story, right? People fall in love with your narrative and very much tied to what Nicole is saying, like it really matters to do the things that you value, um, do the things that you actually find interesting and have fun. Because like at the end of the day, when you apply to medical school, or you apply to anything in life, not even medical school, you want to be able to look back in your life and be like, there's a purpose to all the things that I did, right? And there's a story that chains all these events together and all these activities. And you, I wish I was more deliberate about that story upfront, you know, making sure that all the things that I do had intention behind it, um, all the things that I was interested in or were linked to what I truly valued in my life. So uh, as Nicole said, making sure that I had written down my values somehow, either that's journaling, reflection, something um, to be like, oh, I, I like these things and I really don't like these things. So I'm going to do more of what I like, less of what I don't like and trust that. Yeah, I think all the panelists have given really good points and I would probably use all those tips and kind of incorporate them if I was younger as well. Um, just another thing is, you know, when you apply to uni, apply based on the curriculum and not the ranking, uh, because the ranking criteria is based on a lot of different factors, such as how many international students they get, research, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then a lot of universities teach in different ways, so kind of see what fits you and what you want. Um, and also before you can apply to a place, just go onto YouTube and watch some videos in the city because med school's long. You'll be in the city for four to five years. You don't want to be stuck in a place you don't enjoy. Um, so obviously, ideally, it's best to go and visit the place. Um, but if you're like me and you take the leap of faith, I've never been to Scotland before um, and I kind of just applied and came here and it's lovely. No regrets, but I think looking back, I'd probably um, just do my research. Okay, that's some great advice. So I have a question for all of you. So like, for example, Nicole, you mentioned that you were Canadian and Alf, you mentioned that you went to med school in Australia for a brief amount of time. So for all of you, why did you choose to go to medical school either in the US or the UK, like over any other place? Was there like a specific reason or a specific program or um, anything? Like what was your reason for choosing this specific location? Uh, so for me, um, I actually applied to both Canadian and U.S. medical schools. Um, and so because I did my undergrad here and I just felt like um, I was a little more familiar with the system. I had more resources. My connections were all here. Um, and so I ended up in the U.S. medical school. And then also because um, in terms of like where I want to practice in the future, um, I kind of like did my research um, knowing that if I finished my training here, it would be um, acceptable in Canada, um, but it wasn't the same vice versa. And so kind of just thinking long-term, like, you know, where I want to be and like, um, you know, where I want to practice. Hi there, sorry. So um, the reason why I applied to the UK was because I'm from the UK. Um, I was living abroad in Shanghai for 10 years and I decided that ultimately I want to pursue my career in the UK. So that's the main reason I applied. Secondly, um, the US is far too expensive. <laughs> and I'm being honest here, um, the US, although they have renowned medical schools, I couldn't afford it. Um, so that's why I ultimately decided to study in the UK. Yeah, I know, um, Chloe, you mentioned you, like applying to uh, school out of high school was the norm for the UK. And I, I think I just didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. So I applied to the US and UK schools. I ended up going to a US school uh, because I wanted a little time to explore what I wanted to do. I know the US is a little bit more liberal in that, in that direction. Um, in terms of medical school, I think I applied to the US only, uh, mostly because I was already here. 
um, and I knew that I wanted to practice um, in the U.S. in the future. So that kind of made the decision pretty easy for me. Yeah, I, th I think I applied to UK and Australia. Um, I didn't really want to go to the US because that's a postgrad course. Um, and I didn't really want to take out, uh, spend about seven years. Um, and the university I went to in Australia was UNSW. Um, and their course is six years. And I kind of wanted to save the extra year and spend that as a doctor instead. So kind of left that. Um, also, the teaching in the UK is really good, and I think they place um, a lot of emphasis on communication skills and bedside manners. And just, I think, looking ahead, that's the kind of doctor I want to be, uh, someone who's kind of empathetic. And I thought the UK would be the best place to kind of give me those skills. Um, and I also kind of wanted to explore a new place, so I thought, why not? Okay, um, so I have a question for Nicole Willis and Alep. So, uh, Willis, you met, you said that you went to high school in Hong Kong, and uh, Alep, you went in Singapore. And Nicole, you're not from the U.S., so I want to ask specifically about the path to get into a medical school in the U.S. or the U.K. Did you apply as international students, or how how was the application process like being out of country when you applied? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the steps are pretty much the same, like in terms of like requirements or things to do. Um, but it's just for me, because I was Canadian, I had to look up specific schools that would take Canadian students. Um, we're kind of like an in-between. For some schools, we're considered international. For some schools, we aren't. And so uh, making sure you like, or like I had to um, uh, make a list and then I also have to call the school because like things would change every single year and their website might not be like updated and so like why apply to a school where you can't get accepted right um, so uh, just had to do all of that and then also had to do like more of like the visa stuff after you got in um, but uh, I, I guess Willis can also you know elaborate on that um, but Overall, I think it was just doing more of the prep and more of the making sure like they will accept you. Um, and then also I know like certain schools um, have like special countries that they can accept um, because there's like, you know, like sister schools there. So it's like always, always do your research. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I could be helpful here, but actually, so I'm lucky that I was actually born in the United States. So I happen to be an American citizen. So for me, I, I applied as an American. Um, but I do remember applying to the UK schools and like, like Nicole said, just doing your research to make sure that the school that you are going to can accept um, you as an international student. I know a lot of my friends who are at Duke who are international students said that they had to compile a short list that was different from everyone else because not all schools uh, are able to take international students and making sure that you uh, don't apply to the ones that can't because that's a bit of a waste of time. Yeah, so I apply as an international student as well, um, and it was harder, I think it's a lot harder as an international student to pick universities because you've kind of heard about the cities and, I don't know, I kind of heard about UK cities to football, um, but I didn't really know where they were or what they actually are, um, so it's hard in that sense because you might apply to Birmingham or Bristol and you might not even know where they are on the map, um, so it's hard, but I think kind of doing your research and then like um, the other panelists have said, if you call the university and check your qualifications valid, um, because not all universities accept every single high school qualification. So you just got to make sure. Um, there's also higher requirements for international students and less places. So it's a lot more competitive. I know my uni's got about eight to 10 places for international students compared to 130 for your locals. So it's a lot harder to get in, um, but saying that, here I am, so don't be disheartened. Um, another thing worth checking is if your degree from the university is valid back home if you want to go back and practice. Um, I know for Singapore, not every UK university is um, recognised back home, so you'll have to take another test if you want to work. Um, so just check with your local medical council. So in Singapore, it's called Singapore Medical Council, and then they'll have a list of all the registrable universities. Um, but that's worth checking before you apply. Okay, um, so apologies, my yeah. apologies, my connectivity is not great. Um, but I don't have much to add for the international sort of element. I think doing your research is the best, um, best piece of. 
Um, okay, I think we've lost her on connectivity. So I'll just, we can come back to uh, you, Chloe, and I'll move on to one more thing. So he, he, all of you have heard like what the sort of what the process and what the degree is like in the UK and the US. So I want to ask like, what you think are some benefits of your degree over the other. So if you're in the US, what do you think uh, is like a perk of doing a medical degree in the US over the UK? And if you're in the UK, what do you think a perk is of doing your degree there at inter as compared to doing doing it in the US. So like if people are stuck and they can't choose, um, so what do you think some advantages or disadvantages are? Um, I think, I mean, alluding to what Willis said, like there's, I feel like there's more freedom and kind of more flexibility in terms of an MD degree here. Like you first have to get your bachelor's and you know, with that you kind of really figure out you wanna do medicine um, and then you can also major in different things. And then with even with like the range of MD programs, like you, there are programs where there are dual degrees, there are programs that, you know, have like that extra third year uh, where you can do different things. Um, and I think that gives you more time to develop like other interests, um, like research or like medical education or like health administration, things that you can also develop as a part of your career as an MD. Can everyone hear me? Otherwise, I can come back and answer once Willis and Alep have answered. Uh, we can hear you now. So for this question, you can. OK, fantastic. Um, so if everyone can hear me, I think what Nicole said about um, about understanding what what universities and what courses they offer. So if you find that the structure of the US courses is better suited to you, then um, look at what ones and what are the differences between, for example, Duke or Virginia Common University or whatever the location is. And then in the UK, do the same. So do you want it early clinical exposure or do you want to do a few years of didactic learning? You have to kind of understand what you think will best prepare you because that might not be the same for everyone. Um, I would say that is ultimately the best thing that you can do. Um, and about my course, for example, we did anatomy quite early on and some courses don't do as much anatomy. Um, one of the other things I think you should consider is the intercalated degree. So typically in the UK, you can do three years of medical school and then intercalate to get an integrated bachelor's degree and then do your two years of uh, graduate, like your clinical years after that. I personally didn't take that because I had done my previous bachelor's degree in biomedical science before medical school, but uh, you can do that. And it might be interesting to see what universities are around that you would be interested in. What sort of courses would you want to take? Are you interested in healthcare management? Are you interested in radiology? Are you interested in whatever else? Um, so do explore those as well before applying to the medical schools, because that's always good to be prepared. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this with, I don't really understand the uh, UK medical system as well as I, I understand the American one, but I think one thing that's interesting to think about before you apply is uh, to think about the, the context of the healthcare system that you'll be working in. Um, so the UK system, the NHS, very different from the American healthcare system. Um, I, I have my own personal feelings about how the American healthcare system is working right now, but I think there's a lot of a lot of problems that uh, that like you know are, are that need to be fixed, and I think the wonderful thing about studying the U.S. Uh, as Nicole had mentioned is the flexibility in sort of defining your career early uh, by differentiating yourself um, outside of just the medicine component. So I think a lot of programs in the U.S. Uh, sort of emphasize a, a, a the dual degree nature. I'm doing MD MBA, and other programs have other emphasis so to help you set yourself apart and. Basically, I think there's a lot of innovation happening in the mer in the U.S. healthcare system, and it starts early in medical school. So I think uh, it's an exciting place to be um, in the U.S. right now, just because I think uh, a lot of changes are going to happen in the next two decades or so, and uh, it's 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 interesting to study uh, in that context to know that you can have a pretty significant impact in the future. Um, uh, and I, you know, the U.S. healthcare system is constantly welcoming new ideas, so that's something to consider. I think all of the points that I was going to bring up have been brought up already. Um, I'm just going to add on a last B point is um, just, I think just what lifestyle fits you better is something you should consider because life in the UK and US is quite different um, with not just regards to food, but kind of the weather, which plays a big part. Um, so I think just make sure you know what kind of lifestyle you want to live. Um, 
and what might suit you better. Also, the UK medical school is a lot shorter as well. So if that's something you want to consider, um, that can be factored in. Um, and like the other panelists have said already, it's more liberal in the US. So if you're not 100% sure you want to do medicine, it might be best to go to the US and kind of take that extra time to figure out this is really what you want to do. Um, and working in, and if studying in the UK, you'll be in the NHS from day one. Um, and working in public health, um, although it's, it's good, it's got its drawbacks and it can be frustrating at times. Um, but that's something that will shape you as a doctor and that will make you who you are. So can I just factor that in as well? Okay, perfect. I think that's amazing advice. You all touched a bit on how to choose the programs too. So I think that's good because it covers some of our questions. So working, uh, uh, moving on to a bit more of like the work aspect of the career. Um, first of all, before I move on, I just want to remind the attendees, there is a question in the chat that I'll come back to at the end. But if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please don't hesitate to ask them in the chat and I'll make sure to bring them up. So moving on to the work part, I want to ask you, Willis, you mentioned that you're doing a dual degree in business. Why did you choose this? Because this is, you know, I mean, very different to medicine. So what was your reasoning behind doing this? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think um, the business degree wasn't on top of my mind when I applied to medical school. So I applied just as a straight MD. Um, but during my second year, like I said, we get into clinics pretty early. And I actually was originally in the primary care leadership track. So I was interested in doing something in primary care. Uh, I, I worked a lot with primary care physicians and I got increasingly frustrated with the fact that I didn't feel empowered. Uh, as a future clinician to be able to help these patients, uh, especially when it comes to chronic diseases like heart disease, um, diabetes, obesity, kidney, chronic kidney disease. I felt that um, the people that had the most influence on being able to affect change um, were people who were in the industries, you know, people who were um, working in the food industry, in the agriculture industry, and people who did transportation and public policy. And I was looking for an opportunity to meet and hopefully get to understand how these people think, uh, how leaders of corporate America, how leaders of nonprofit worlds, how leaders of uh, the healthcare systems um, understood, you know, how, how to lead these industries. So I business school just seemed like a good opportunity to meet more people and have those conversations. Um, so that's when I applied to business school here at Duke is also, um, yeah. Okay, perfect. So you you mentioned like you were into the primary leadership track so this is a question for all of you like do you know like what you're thinking of specializing in or what you want to uh end your degree with like because there are a lot of special specializations in uh medicine so what are you thinking of and why did you come to that decision um for me i want to go into internal medicine and then probably gi and hepatology um i really like internal medicine i like I'm definitely not a surgical person. I know that now, uh, definitely the, the culture and like just being able to like, I don't know. I like to like talk to my patients, come up with diagnosis, write notes, like that's that's my jam. Um, but I also really like the acuity of like inpatient medicine. Like there's like a focused issue um, that you have an end goal too, right? Like you want to get them out of the hospital. Um, and I just really like like the environment. I feel like even as a medical student, I felt like a part of the team. I felt like people like valued what I, <clears throat> excuse me, had to say and um, people were like really willing to teach. And so like, those are some of the people I want to surround myself with um, in a career moving forward. Um, and then GI, just because I think it's a really cool organ system. Um, if you think about it, technically we are just like a hollow tube. Um, from inside to outside, but um, I just think it's really cool. Um, so my interest is in women's health, so in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, I find the uh, female body um, and the fact that it can carry a pregnancy absolutely immense. It's also the dual aspect of caring not only for the patient, but for their baby or babies if they're carrying more than one. Um, and also the combination of both surgery and medicine alongside the combination of obstetrics and gynecology. So being on call, working nights, but also working in clinics, I think it's quite a varied and exciting specialty. So I promise I have original ideas, but I also want to go into internal medicine and possibly GI, um, but mostly because I think 
like Nicole said, in, in the U.S., you sort of make the split decision in the beginning whether you want to go surgery or you want to go medicine. Um, I made a decision pretty early on that surgery wasn't for me. Um, and uh, like I said, I want to do primary care. But the uh, what, my, what I've been really passionate about lately has been food as medicine. Um, I'm really passionate about the power of what we eat and how we eat it and how we interact with food. Uh, and how that interacts with the, our health. And I feel like GI, I, uh, lately with, uh, with some research in microbiomes, I think that's a natural sort of segue into what I'm, I'm interested in medicine. So that's what I want to do in terms of medicine GI. Um, I think if you're, if you're in the UK, you kind of do two years out after med school as a junior doctor, um, in which you kind of rotate around different specialties. So you'll rotate in surgery, medicine, and then primary care. And then after two years, you'll apply to specialize. So if you're unsure, um, you can still take the two years after med school to kind of think about it. Um, I was quite sure about surgery from about second or third year. Um, and I kind of wanted orthopedic surgery uh, just because I think it's, it's quite cool with all the equipment and the tools that they've got. It's basically carpentry if you think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I really like orthopedic surgery. Um, and I think that's what I'll probably apply for. Okay, perfect. So I want to know if there, what are some certain like misconceptions that people have about your fields so that could be on medicine in general or your spe uh, your specialization. So any mi misconceptions and stories surrounding it? Um, I feel like one thing people always think about, um, at least U.S. doctors, is that we get paid a lot. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely true, considering how much um, debt people have to pay off and like work life balance. Um, I know there's like a lot of studies out there, but um, and I haven't been able to like provide any evidence, but um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't know, Willis can probably elaborate on numbers and money. Hi there, sorry, I'm, um, I'm back now at a steady um, Wi-Fi pace. I think one of the misconceptions about the UK is also the money, because as much as um, it's not all about the money, we still need to earn money and live. Um, and it's the fact that people think, oh, you're going to earn so much as the doctor, and of course you earn more than the average, but it still is um, not as well paid as all the jobs should be in the world, um, really, in, in an ideal world. Um, yeah, I would agree, agree with Nicole on that. Yeah, um, hey, but just, just, just to clarify, your question was on like misconceptions in medicine. Yeah, any misconceptions or myths, anything you, you've heard or you want to clarify? Yeah, okay, so I, maybe this is a, a bit of a, uh, so I want to clarify that I think people have this view of medicine as this like terrible, uh, super hard, you know, work till you're done, don't sleep sort of situation. Uh, and I want to say that that's like not what it is at all. Uh, you know, I get plenty of sleep in medical school. I do fine. Um, I have great balance. I have great friends. I still get to enjoy certain things in small packets. I think it, it requires a little bit of planning um, and a little bit of sacrifice. You can't do it all the time. But uh, and there's like there's there's seasons, you know, there's like ups and downs in medical school where yeah, there's maybe weeks and nights that you don't get too much sleep. And uh, maybe you're on a surgery rotation where you don't get too much sleep on those days. But like in general, um, most people in medical school are very happy. Um, and like I think it is actually a really fun uh, and wholesome and wonderful place to be. So like I hope people don't think of medical school as like, oh, I'm going to go to four years of like terrible life. Um, uh, but that's not true. You're going to have a good time. You're going to be surrounded by great, great people uh, and doing something hopefully that you love. So. Yeah, that was really good advice from Willis, actually. Um, that's true. I know the media kind of portrays it as well as this thing that you could engulfs your life and you have nothing around it. But then I think a lot of medical students eventually find that balance that works for them. Um, I think a, I think a myth in in surgery um, is that you kind know, of orthopedic surgeons are the dumbest surgeons um, because all they do is cut open bones and they kind of cut the patient up and then they fix them after. And neurosurgeons are the smartest and they operate on the brain. Um, I don't know if this is a biased opinion, but I think that's not true. I think all surgeons are equally smart, um, and there should be no hate towards orthopedic surgeons.
Amazing. That's great to hear that it's not as bad as it seems. And uh, for anyone who is um, hesitant to go into the career. So I have uh, a few final questions. So how do you think that the medical industry will develop in the next five years? I think Willis, you like touched upon this in a previous question, but how do you think the industry will develop and what advice would you give to those thinking of pursuing a similar career? I think at least in the US, um, from personal experience, I feel like um, research is going to definitely be a more um, play a larger part in patient care in terms of utilizing um, a lot of um, new therapies and also um, kind of like new techniques to treat different medicine. Um, and with that comes like all the side effects that we don't know about. Um, and so for me personally, I felt like my background in um, molecular biology was really helpful um, just to like uh, know more about like um, all of the, like the cool drugs that are coming out. Um, but um, I think something else that, you know, Willis touched upon is kind of like the healthcare policy and like um, kind of the healthcare system making changes. Um, you know, he talked about like, um, kind of like receptive to new ideas. And I think that I've definitely seen more kind of um, different types of um, healthcare delivery styles and um, methods. And so that's something um, would look out for. Um, I think something in the UK that um, is coming more apparent. So we have, um, as um, Alec alluded to earlier, you do two years of foundation training post-medical school before you do your specialty training. And before in the UK, you could go into medicine and you become a core trainee where you do a couple of years. It's now turned into internal medicine, which is very kind of mirrors the US sort of system. And more and more um, people in that training scheme and in that training pathway have to become more generalists like GPs and family physicians. They have to understand a lot about um, a little about a lot of things. And I think that's something that the UK is going to turn towards as, as much as there's importance for specialties specialty surgeons, obstetricians, you know, people like that, I think uh, they will expect more of you if you go in internal medicine and you'll become something called a medical registrar, which is the step before a consultant or an attending, and they're absolute whizzes in the hospital. They just know everything. So I think that kind of generalist approach is definitely something that the UK is heading towards. Um, and I think my main bit of advice for people who are um, in the next few years applying for medical school and then becoming doctors is just to be open to that and be open that you may go into medical school saying you wanted to be a family physician like Willis, but actually decided that internal medicine is more your thing. And just to be open to any of that. I didn't really consider obstetrics or gynecology before I started my, uh, my placement in second year. And then as soon as I saw my first um, vaginal natural birth, I was just amazed by it. So I would never put anything uh, to the side and completely um, negate that it could be the career you end up in. Yeah, Chloe, I'm just, now you just reminded me of my first vaginal birth and wow, what an experience that was. Uh, definitely don't wanna do OB, hats off to you. Um, um, so I think in terms of, um, Changes in medicine, I, the way I see, I think in the U.S. especially, we something that we don't do very well that I think the NHS and the U.K. do does a lot better than we do um, is thinking about population health and thinking about primary care. Uh, I think the NHS does a great job uh, in terms of uh, providing equitable access to everybody um, to, for health care, whereas U.S. not so much, right? We, we have a bit of a more fee-for-service uh, system um, that's changing uh, dramatically in the recent years with managed care, but I think that's the biggest innovation in the US healthcare system that I see happening uh, is that primary care hopefully will be more emphasized in the coming years, social terms of health, things like you know food security, housing security, um, transportation, uh, healthcare access uh, will become a big deal. So I think um, when it comes to medical school, I think medical schools are now looking for people who are interested in, in those areas. Uh, I, I see a lot of people who are, are younger than I am who are working deeply in the, the sort of like social terms of health space and health innovations. As Nicole mentioned, there's a lot of new care delivery models that we haven't seen before, t um, telehealth and, um, uh, you know, like sort of non-traditional fee-for-service hospital-based medicine coming out. So um, keep an eye out for that. I'd say, you know, um, I read the news um, and see if uh, as Chloe mentioned, there's a, there's a specific niche that you might fit in that you hadn't thought of before uh, that's coming up and emerging. Um, if, for example, like a telehealth psychiatrist, you know, that didn't exist like 10 years ago, so, but now it does. So. 
Yeah, I think um, just like the US, the healthcare in the UK is drastically changing. Um, and I think the NHS will look very different 10 years down the line. Um, with the, the burden that's on the NHS, there's lots of talks about privatisation. No one knows if that will go through. I think it's unlikely. Um, but there might be some sort of semi-privatisation that happens. And um, I'm not sure how medical schools will change, how the training programme will change because of that. Um, but there's also COVID has also changed the NHS. There's no, there's more video consults going on. There's more kind of near me um, things where you can uh, consult using videos. Um, and that's definitely changed private. Uh, primary care has been changed as well. There's lots of triage on the phones instead of just going to the GP. Um, so all of that can uh, change the teaching that we receive and that'll definitely change over the years. Um, there's also heavy emphasis on, on using allied health professionals to manage patients and kind of working in the multidisciplinary team. Um, so just using the physios, the occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, et cetera, to kind of manage the patient. So it's not just the doctor and the nurse as it traditionally was, it's kind of using everyone around it to kind of manage your patient. And that's definitely been changed. Okay, that's very insightful. So we have uh, one other question here in the chat. I think this will be the last question. So it's regarding the scholarships. And as persons asked, is it easier to get scholarship for undergrad or postgrad? So I'm assuming any kind of advice you have on getting scholarships would be appreciated. I don't have too much to offer. Um, I felt like as an international applying to both undergrad and grad, um, there were like limited options for me. So I'll leave it to the other panelists. Apologies again, I, I don't know anything about scholarships. The only thing I would suggest is to ring up a universities directly to make sure you get the most up-to-date information because although they release PDFs and guides online, um, sometimes they've changed their, um, not rules, but their guidelines last minute. Um, and also is to look outside of the universities. There are some great charities that might offer um, not full scholarships, but payment towards certain fees. Um, and just to make sure that you're looking outside of the university um, healthcare space. I know in the UK, at least you can get, um, and I don't, I don't know if this is relevant for uh, international students, but you can actually get like the army, the Navy or the Royal Air Force to sponsor your degree, but then you are um, bound to work for them for like four, five, six years after. But that's just the only thing I know, not a scholarship, but um, an, a, a help um, throughout medical school. Yeah, to answer the question directly, I don't know if one's easier than the other, but I will say it's something I wish I knew before and I wish I've learned over time is to, to you not be shy about asking for scholarships. And uh, as Chloe said, calling people up, calling the admissions office and asking what's, what opportunities are available because um, if you don't ask them, they won't tell you. You know, at schools, as much as they love you and want to be supportive, they also are a business and they're trying to keep as much money as possible. But if you ask, I, I think it's what I'm saying is don't be shy about trying to ask for opportunities, but also negotiate opportunities. So let's say you get into a couple of schools. Some schools have better scholarship offers for you than others. Don't be shy to use those as a leverage point um, when you talk to other schools that you really want to go to and be like, hey, this other school is offering me this wonderful scholarship. I really want to come here. Uh, your, you know, your school speaks to me in terms of your program. What can we do? Is there any, is there anything that you can help me out with? You know, there's a, there's a good way to go about it. Um, that's cordial. That's not aggressive. Uh, but don't be shy. Yeah, I think um, I did have a wee look before I kind of came to the UK. Um, but there's almost there's very few to almost no scholarships um, for international students offered by universities in the UK, and that's because international students are paying members. Um, I know in Scotland, local students don't pay for the university, it's just the international students. So there's no incentives for universities to offer you scholarship because that's taking away the funding they receive, um, which does make sense. Um, however, if you've studied in the UK and then you're going to do a postgrad degree, I think you might be eligible for a few scholarships. So it might be best to check then. Um, however, there are scholarships usually offered by home countries for international students going abroad. So, for example, in Singapore, you've got bonded scholarships. So like Chloe mentioned, you bond it to an organization for certain years after. Um, so Singapore does scholarships. So I think they'll pay for about three years of university out of five. And then you go back and work for four or five years to kind of pay off that bond. Um, but I think it's unlikely as international students to get a fully funded scholarship with no, no kind of bond attached to it. 
Okay, perfect. That's amazing. Well, that brings us to the end of our panel. I think you've all been really inspiring and given a lot of insight on how to choose the programs, where to go, and even on how the industry works and will progress. So I think it's very helpful for those who are thinking of going to med medical school in the UK, US, or anywhere in general. So we've come to the end of our panel now, and I want to say a massive thank you to everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to watch the panel. And especially thank you to all of our lovely panelists for giving us your invaluable advice. Um, one last time, I'd like to reiterate that the Global Spring Internship Program is open for applications. So if you're interested, you can find more information on our socials or website. And if you're interested in more panels like this with mentors who have already been on the journey you're about to embark on in terms of universities and careers, you can find more information on our website and socials. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for participating in this event and have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Ibo. Thanks for moderating. Thank you Thank so you much. Very much.